It's the black sheep of Nicktoons that invaded your childhood, stuffed it full of doom and piggies, and then ended far too soon. What else but Invader Zim? So how did they even get this massive cult classic on the air? Turns out that recruiting an edgy comic book writer to create a children's cartoon is just about as easy as taking over the world. I'm Adrian with Channel Frederator, and we're counting down 107 facts that will destroy you. I mean, that you should know about Invader Zim. Let's go. Fact number one. Invader Zim is a twisted creation of alternative comic book artist Jonin Vasquez. Before working on Zim, he had a few comic series, his first being Johnny the Homicidal Maniac, a dark humor comic featuring a knife-wielding psychopath. Yep, Vasquez was perfect children's network material from the beginning. Number two. Vasquez was approached by Nickelodeon after a representative named Mary Harrington liked his work with Squee, a spin-off comic series of Johnny the Homicidal Maniac. Vasquez doubted they wanted to make a series out of his comics, but he was happy to come on board to make a cartoon anyway. Number three. In one interview, Jonin stated that the overall idea for Invader Zim was born from mostly a collection of things Jonin was interested in as a kid. Aliens, paranormal investigators, science fiction, monsters, Monty Python humor, Douglas Adams, and the general horror show of his cinema addiction. Number 4. Vasquez came up with a premise for Invader Zim within an hour. He liked the idea of an alien from an incredibly advanced society with the power to overthrow the planet Earth with minimal effort, deciding to make things harder for himself and stay in school instead. Number 5. Vasquez was only 22 years old when he began work on Invader Zim for Nickelodeon, and he had absolutely no experience in animation beforehand. Most people that age would have just graduated from college and would be begging for a job as a production assistant. Not bad, Jonin. Not bad at all. Number 6. For Vasquez, the biggest change from working on comics to working in TV was the amount of people he had to deal with. Thousands. He called it absolute misery. However, he says that the experience was incredibly gratifying, but also fiendishly frustrating. Number 7. Some people thought Zim's name came from Sergeant Charles Zim from Starship Troopers. But According to Vasquez, his main character was nameless for a long while during the show's development. Zim was actually the name Vasquez gave a Tamagotchi belonging to one of his past girlfriends. Number 8. While working at Nickelodeon in Burbank, Vasquez actually ran into Clancy Brown during a recording session. Clancy Brown, of course, is famous for playing the voice of Mr. Krabs as well as, you guessed it, Sergeant Charles Zim from Starship Troopers. Brown also wondered if there was any connection between the Zims. Number 9. When asked about Zim's design, Vasquez said he looked like any other character stripped down to his basic form. Zim was essentially modeled after the generic idea of what an alien looks like and just went from there. Number 10. An early model of Zim can be seen in Squee when his teddy bear is explaining to Squee all the things to be afraid of. Vasquez was working on conceptual art for Zim at the time, so he just slipped it in there. Number 11. Zim's personality is based on the part of Jonin Vasquez that refuses to listen to anybody who has ever tried to hold him back from achieving his goals. Those who told him that he'd never make a substantial living drawing cartoons. The only difference is that Vasquez is relentless benefits him, while Zim's is purely self-destructive. You hear that, kids? You can do anything you set your mind to, unless it's world domination, in which case you'll become a laughingstock. Number 12. Invader Zim's series director was Steve Russell, who had previously directed many of Klasky Chupo's Nicktoons like Rugrats, The Wild Thornberries, and Rocket Power. Number 13. The show's original composer, Michael Tavera, wasn't a great fit for the show. Vasquez described his music as having a more children's television sound, with a much more traditional and not as surprising theme. Members of the Invader Zim crew felt that Tavera's theme was out of place, finding it humorous how cheesy it was. However, they added that the reaction was not mean-spirited, and that Tavera had received little information about the series before submitting the music. Number 14. Kevin Manthe replaced Tavera, and was nominated for Outstanding Individual Achievement for Music Score in Animated Television Production at the 2001 Annie Awards. He has also created music for shows like Generator Rex and Robot Chicken. Number 15. Invader Zim's art style was initially difficult for the overseas animation studio to learn. Animation director Steve Russell even admits it was the hardest style he had ever worked on, citing the characters' heads as the most complicated aspect of the design. Number 16. When development on the show was getting started, Steve Russell consulted with the crew of Futurama to figure out how to integrate 3D animation with 2D animation, as they were one of the first shows that merged the two mediums. When the Futurama folks saw the show, they were very impressed by how seamlessly the Zim crew integrated both methods, specifically during the episode The Wetning, when Zim drops a colossal water balloon on the planet. Number 17. While the average number of storyboards for an 11-minute episode of an animated show usually comes to around 80 to 120 pages, Invader Zim's storyboards averaged in around 250 to 350 pages per 11-minute episode. This was because Invader Zim had a very dedicated attention to detail, outlining every ounce of a character's movements and method of acting, something Nickelodeon was especially impressed by at the time. Number 18. When casting voice actors for the show, Vasquez didn't want actors that were capable of just doing zany voices because it felt less natural to him. He made a point to cast people with speaking voices 
that were naturally distinct and away from the norm, so that the cast didn't have to do voices, but rather just speak. Number 19. Zim was played by Richard Stephen Horvitz. If you're a big fan of 90s Nicktoons and feel like you've heard his voice before, you have. He also played Daggett Beaver on The Angry Beavers. Number 20. Horvitz was not always attached to play the role. For the original unaired pilot of Invader Zim, the titular Erkin Invader was originally played by Luke Skywalker himself, Mark Hamill. Hamill was replaced before the pilot was shown to Nickelodeon execs because it didn't feel right to Vasquez. Hamill was replaced by voice acting legend Billy West, whose voice does appear in the unaired pilot. After the show was picked up, Vasquez decided to go with his original choice, Horvitz. Number 21. The reason Zim has a pack is because Joan and Vasquez liked the idea of Zim always wearing something that resembled a backpack. Vasquez states that giving a backpack to Zim makes spelling out visual movement easier. Steve Russell also claims that this is because Vasquez himself loves wearing backpacks and can almost always be seen wearing one. Number 22. So what if Zim actually took over the Earth? Vasquez has said that if it were up to Zim, he would rule it all, but that the Urkin Armada would demean the planet to something like a parking lot. Well, maybe Zim could be the parking manager. The king of the parking lot. Number 23. Vasquez wanted somebody without an acting background to play Gurr because it was a perfect reflection of how much of a messed up and broken machine Gurr actually is. He wanted somebody that wasn't slick and sounded unprofessional. Number 24. Gurr's adorably irksome voice was provided by Ricky Simons. Gurr was his first SAG voiceover job, yet he was a background movie actor through the 90s. One movie he recalls being in was Airheads. He was a colorist on the Invader Zim staff who had a unique voice that resonated with Joan and Vasquez's demented mind. Ricky jokingly offered to audition and he got the part. The same month he auditioned, he also helped color the pilot in November 1998. Number 25. Ricky auditioned some different voices for his Gurr voice. His first voice was trying to imitate his mother-in-law, but it was too shrieky. He then remembered back in the day when he would play with hand puppets with his dad and did one of those voices. Number 26. Frequently, after Gurr drinks something, he launches into an inexplicable coughing fit. This is due to the fact that Ricky Simons has asthma and making Gurr's slurping noises for more than five seconds causes him to cough for a minimum of a minute straight. Number 27. In the Urkin army, all invaders get a robot companion called SIR, or SIR, a standard issue information retrieval unit. The G in Gurr stands for, well, garbage, since he is made out of garbage parts. Number 28. A scrapped concept of Gurr's character design was that he originally filled his dog suit with ground beef to give his body something of a fleshy consistency. At least he was putting more thought into his disguise than Zim. Or maybe it was just another way he could store another snack in his body. Number 29. Did wears a t-shirt identical to that of the character Squee from Joan and Vasquez's spin-off Johnny the Homicidal Maniac comic called Squee. Number 30. Vasquez chose to make Dib's father a scientist so that Dib would have access to advanced technology to combat Zim's advanced Urkin technology. But who really needs advanced alien technology when you've got super toast? Number 31. At one point in development, Nickelodeon executives did not like the fact that Dib wore a trench coat as it reminded them of the shooters of Columbine High School, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold, who wore trench coats as well. They opted to have him wear something else, but their efforts were unsuccessful. Number 32. Dib's coat was just the tip of the iceberg. During the show's first season, the execs at Nickelodeon didn't find Dib to be that interesting of a character. In an effort to remedy the situation, Vasquez pitched an in-house initiative called God Save the Dib to the character artist. It was to make slight readjustments to Dib's design and personality to make him more appealing. One of these changes was making Dib's head much bigger than his body, a change that became a recurring joke in the show. Number 33. Dib isn't the only one that knows Zim is an alien. According to Vasquez, Gaz is well aware of Zim's true identity and his plans for global conquest, but couldn't care less because, unlike Dib, she knows Zim is too incompetent to pull through with his ultimate goal. Number 34. Gaz's name is short for Gasoline, which is a play on gasoline. This is rather fitting with her personality as well. Like gasoline, when ignited, Gaz has a very fiery temper. Number 35. Although Steve Russell states that Gaz possesses vague supernatural abilities to a certain degree, Vasquez confirms that Gaz doesn't have any powers at all. She's just someone you don't want to anger. Seriously, don't even try. Number 36. Of all the characters on the show that he's written for, Vasquez says he enjoys writing for Gaz the most. He claims that, to him, Gaz is the most relatable character on the show and that her anger towards everybody around her is justified, especially when those people are Dib and Zim. In fact, he feels like he didn't work on her character enough. Number 37. According to Vasquez, the characters in the series don't have definitive ages. However, he has said that Dib is around 11 years old, Gaz is one year younger than Dib, and Zim is older than any human alive. He looks pretty good for somebody over 122 years old. Number 38. Scientific genius Professor Membrane was 
played by Roger Bumpus, who is known for playing Dr. Light from Teen Titans and the underappreciated genius Squidward Tentacles. Number 39. Vasquez has confirmed via his blog that Dib, Gaz, Johnny, and Professor Membrane are all Mexican. He draws them as, quote, pasty white Mexicans because Vasquez wanted to have the characters represent his sister and his family. Vasquez stated this was never mentioned on the show because it never served the story. Number 40. Voicing the cold and demonic Miss Bitters was a huge contrast to the other roles Lucille Bliss had played in the past. The accomplished actress had previously played roles in Disney films like Cinderella, Alice in Wonderland, and Peter Pan, but the warmest and most innocent of her roles was definitely Smurfette from the Smurfs. Boy, time sure does change people. Number 41. Miss Bitters looks identical to the teacher character seen in Squee. Does this mean that Invader Zim and Squee exist in a shared universe? Look, we're not the ones that cover conspiracies on cartoons. Go bug that other show about it. Number 42. Miss Bitters' movements were based on the movements of ghosts, snakes, and the velociraptors from Jurassic Park. I bet nobody in that class ever misses a homework assignment. Number 43. Almighty Tallest Purple wasn't the only alien oaf Kevin McDonald has played. He's also the man behind Agent Pleakley from the Lilo and Stitch franchise. Number 44. According to Wally Winger, the Almighty Tallest Red's voice actor, the Almighty Tallest aren't actually tall Urkins. Rather, they're average-sized Urkins placed inside robotic suits that make them appear taller. However, this has never been confirmed. Number 45. As per Urkin tradition, those that are promoted to Almighty Tallest must cut off their thumbs. However, Steve Russell believes that Almighty Tallest's red and purple were slick enough to dodge this and probably have their thumbs hidden within their gauntlets. Number 46. The Almighty Tallest's obsession is based on their amplified childish behavior. This obsession sounds awfully similar to Joan and Vasquez's own cravings for junk food. Steve Russell claims that Vasquez would frequently make small trips to the 7-Eleven near the Nick Animation Studio and would almost always be eating various snack foods, especially the fruity ones that would make the rest of the crew's stomachs turn. Number 47. The Urkin's very own punching bag, Invader Scooge, was played by Ted Raimi, the brother of acclaimed director Sam Raimi, who's responsible for films like The Evil Dead and the original Spider-Man trilogy. Some of Ted's other noteworthy roles include Joxer from Xeno Warrior Princess and Hoffman from his brother's Spider-Man films. Number 48. The voice of Zim's incredibly unenthusiastic computer is none other than Vasquez himself. Number 49. While Zim is the title character of the show, Dib has actually appeared in more episodes and has his name in more episode title cards. Zim appears in 27 episodes, while Dib appears in 28. Game Slave 2 is the only episode where the invader isn't featured. Although, to be fair, the show is called Invader Zim, so he has Dib beat there. Number 50. Invader Zim's iconic title sequence caught the attention of the World Animation Celebration, which awarded it the best title sequence in 2001. Number 51. Invader Zim began strong with his first episode, The Nightmare Begins, which won storyboard artist Kyle Menk a Primetime Emmy for Outstanding Individual in Animation at the 2001 Primetime Emmy Awards. This episode also earned Steve Russell the Annie Award for Outstanding Individual Achievement for Storyboarding in an Animated Television Production. Number 52. When Zim is cycling through his disguise options in The Nightmare Begins, he cites two of the rejected disguises as too ugly and too stinky. The ugly design is the animated cameo of series creator Jonan Vasquez, while the stinky design is series director Steve Russell. These cameo appearances were not commissioned by Russell or Vasquez, rather they were planted by the show's storyboard artists. Russell and Vasquez's cameos would become a running gag amongst the show's staff, who would continue to randomly place them throughout various episodes until Vasquez asked them to stop as he felt that they were distracting and too distinct as background characters. Number 53. There are more cameos in the show than just Russell and Vasquez. Several cast and crew members insert themselves, like Aaron Alexovich, the character designer, Rob Hummel, the writer, and Ricky Simons, the voice of Gurr. Number 54. Sim's classmate, Old Kid, was modeled after a former security guard at the Nickelodeon Animation Studio named Don Newhouse, who unfortunately passed away in 2015. Newhouse was known for making his way into other Nickelodeon shows like SpongeBob SquarePants and Fanboy and Chum Chum. Number 55. Surprisingly enough, Dark Harvest was the first script after The Nightmare Begins to be approved by Nickelodeon. For those of you that need a reminder, Dark Harvest was the episode in which Zim steals other children's vital organs for himself. Dark Harvest's original name was The Hearts and Lungs of Zim's Darkness. Did Nickelodeon, like, forget their children's network? Number 56. At the start of Dark Harvest, you can see a tiny pink bunny floating in a jar. This creature is actually another reference to Jonah Vasquez's comics, a character of his named Filler Bunny from the comic of the same name that ran for three issues. Number 57. According to Steve Russell, Nickelodeon held a test screening of Dark Harvest, during which one girl ran out of the room crying before the episode even ended. The rest of the kids were clearly terrified by what they saw, but put on faces of bravery to impress one another. Number 58. The episode Best Best's friend took a bit of 
of inspiration from Jonan Vasquez's experience while working on the pilot. There, he met an animator named Heath, which he eventually befriended. Heath's name and cyborg eyes were inspired by Heath. Number 59. Jonan Vasquez added a faded image of Gurr at the end of Bess's friend because they had to show that Keith wasn't dead. There was originally going to be a line of dialogue over the mushroom cloud, but the crew didn't find the line funny enough. In the end, they decided to go for the weird ending and slap Gurr on top of it. Number 60. The school kids jumping out of the window at the end of the day was a gag added by Steve Russell, who claims something like that happened in his life. When he was in art school, his classmates would be so eager to leave that they would exit out of the classroom windows and climb down the building's brick wall. Number 61. Zim overcame his weakness of water by coating himself in paste every day before he goes out into the world. On reflection, Steve Russell wishes they could have added a few scenes in other episodes where Zim bathes in paste while preparing a plan or talking to Gurr just to keep things consistent and keep this fact in the viewer's heads. Number 62. When the show was in production, Gurr's voice actor, Ricky Simons, got a new car. The car was so bizarre and green that Vasquez and the crew thought it would be funny to watch it get crushed. So he wrote a gag into Invasion of the Idiot Dog Brain in which a man is obsessing over his brand new car, only to have Gurr ironically crush it moments later. While the man looked nothing like Ricky, the car was very similar to his model. Number 63. The writer of Plague of Babies, Rob Hummel, actually has a problem with babies in real life. He finds them disturbing, especially with the way they breathe so heavily. Yuck. Number 64. The plot of the episode Plague of Babies is very similar in plot to the 60s horror film Village of the Damned. In both, it is revealed that the children of a small town are actually supernatural beings with abnormal abilities. Number 65. In Plague of Babies, you can see bunny dolls with human faces in Newcomb's room. These faces are that of storyboard artist Brian Konietzko. You may know him from his work on Avatar The Last Airbender and The Legend of Korra, two awesome shows that he had a huge hand in co-creating. Number 66. In the episode of Plague of Babies, the goth girl from Vasquez's Meanwhile is visible in the background. Number 67. Invader Zim was influenced by the works of Canadian film director David Cronenberg, known for his disturbing body horror films. The episode Balonius Maximus, in which Dibs slowly transforms into Baloney, is heavily based on Cronenberg's film The Fly, starring Jurassic Park star Jeff Goldblum. The Fly tells the story of a scientist who accidentally causes himself to transform into a disgusting, half-human, half-fly hybrid. Number 68. The episode Germs is a tribute to the science fiction story, The War of the Worlds, in which humans defeat their alien invaders using the latter's vulnerability to germs that humans had built up an immunity for. Number 69. According to Jonan Vasquez, the man dressed as Poop Dog hates his life and his job, and is forced to play Poop Dog against his will. Vasquez likes to think of the film crew as holding his family hostage, and the only way they'll be let go is if he abides to their terms. Number 70. The alternative future Zim shows his customers when he manipulates them into buying his candy in the episode Door to Door. The future simulation was originally a burning city that resembled New York, but after 9-11, the sequence was replaced. On reflection, Vasquez actually prefers the replacement as he not only finds it funnier, but he also disliked the inclusion of a real-life city in the Invader Zim world. Number 71. The plain white look of the room with a moose was based off the empty white and barren rooms seen in the Stanley Kubrick film 2001 A Space Odyssey. Number 72. The paranormal investigator that Dib shadows during career day was designed after the Smith agents from the Matrix trilogy. He was supposed to be voiced by Bruce Campbell, star of the Evil Dead films, but this unfortunately never came to pass. Number 73. Game Slave 2 was written to be a mockery of the hype culture that ensued for the launch of the PlayStation 2, which had launched the previous year, and the Microsoft Xbox, which was preparing to launch when the episode was being developed. Vasquez and the crew were effectively mocking themselves, as they too were huge gamers. Number 74. A Fargo reference in Invader Zim? The binary conversion between the Planet Jackers in the episode with the same name mirrors the Twin Cities conversion between Steve Buscemi and Peter Stormare in Fargo. Number 75. The episode Mortos del Soul Stealer has a slightly modified opening sequence. If you pause the sequence just as one of the cables from Zim's house engulfs the screen, you can see a still image of Gurr covered in blood. This is the infamous Bloody Gurr picture. It was created when Nickelodeon refused to show blood and gore on the show, so the crew slipped a frame of it in a few episodes. Ricky Simons, the voice of Gurr, was a background painter for the show and actually colored Bloody Gurr. Number 76. The aliens featured in the episode Abducted are identical to the aliens that appear in Jonan Vasquez's Squee. The aliens are equally as incompetent in both incarnations. Number 77. The voices of the aliens in Abducted caused the Invader Zim staff a lot of trouble. The aliens were originally played by Jonan Vasquez and writer Eric Truhart, but the Nick execs hated their performances. Cut them some slack. The writers. The staff then tried to get some of the guys behind Monty Python to voice the idiotic extraterrestrials, but they refused to work on anything together anymore. This prolonged search for voice actors pushed the episode's air dates far behind its intended 
intended release date. Number 78. Dib's all-out war with the Urkins in the episode Dib's Wonderful Life of Doom was heavily influenced by the events of Roland Emmerich's film Independence Day. Number 79. The original idea behind Zim Eats Waffles was to have the longest single shot in animation history that would just consist of Dib sitting at a computer watching Zim's antics in one room of his home base, but this severely limited the episode's storytelling capabilities. At least most of the episode is confined to a single space. Number 80. The horns on the head of the Resisti leader, Lard Nar, were actually meant to be moving pincers, but the rest of the crew were unaware that Vasquez intended for that to be the case, so they were misinterpreted as dull, boring, stationary horns. Number 81. All of the first season and part of the second season of the series were produced before Nickelodeon cancelled the show, since it had low ratings among the channel's target audience and the high cost of making the show. Number 82. After the episode The Fry Cook that came from all that space in 2002, all the other episodes were scrapped and the show was cancelled. A total of nine finished episodes went unaired. Some of these episodes eventually did air four years later, starting with Backseat Drivers from Beyond the Stars, which premiered in the US on the Nicktoons network on June 10, 2006. Number 83. The episode The Most Horrible Xmas Ever was created out of order, which is evident by the presence of the Mini Moose, who is thrown in without a proper introduction. This is because Mini Moose's introductory episode, Nubs of Doom, was intended to be made before the Christmas special. But because Nickelodeon was planning on shutting the show down, the show's staff had to pick their final episodes very carefully. Vasquez decided that he was more excited about the most horrible Xmas ever than the episodes that were planned to come before it, so Nubs of Doom went unfinished. Number 84. When it became abundantly clear that Nick wanted to cancel Invader Zim, the show's staff intended to end it with an episode called 10 Minutes of Doom, in which Dib detaches Zim's pack, giving him 10 minutes in real time to get it back with a timer placed in the corner of the screen. The writers originally intended for Zim to die at the end of the episode to give the series a clean ending, but Nickelodeon refused on the grounds that they may have wanted to continue the series in the future, so Zim survived the ordeal. The episode was written and the voices were recorded, but the episode was never finished. Number 85. There was going to be a two-part season finale involving Microbs. The episode had outlines, but not a lot of anything else, so the fans dubbed this two-part episode The Battle for Microb. Number 86. If the series was properly funded and was made to its completion, then the last episode would have been a TV movie titled Invader Dib. Dib would have managed to get to the Urkin Empire and start a full-fledged war, eventually taking over. This would have been after season 5, which means they had plans all the way to 5 seasons. Netflix, you revive old shows do something, please. Number 87. There was a scrapped episode simply titled Pants, where an alien pair of pants invades Earth. Whoever wore these pants became an alien weapon. This was scrapped before cancellation because it was too similar to the episode When Pants Attack from Jimmy Neutron. However, the episode was eventually adapted in the comic. Number 88. Some of the scrapped episodes were kind of weird, even by the show's standards. One of the scrapped episodes was titled It Feeds on Noodles, where Zim becomes a vampire and feeds on Chinese food. He uses chopsticks as fangs. See? Weird. Number 89. During its initial broadcast, Invader Zim was the recipient of three awards and seven nominations. Number 90. The show was nominated for five other Annie Awards in 2001. Outstanding achievement in a primetime or late night animated television production. Outstanding individual achievement for directing in an animated television production for Steve Russell for episode Dark Harvest. Outstanding individual achievement for music score in an animated television production, Kevin Manthe. Outstanding individual achievement for production design in an animated television production, Vasquez himself, an outstanding individual achievement for voice acting by a male performer in an animated television production, Richard Steven Horvitz. Hot damn, that is a lot. Number 91. In March 2010, episodes of Invader Zim were aired on Nicktoons. The reruns were the second highest rated show on the network and, according to Vasquez, were part of a plan by the network to see if a revival of Invader Zim was feasible. Vasquez was asked to revive the show, however the budget Nickelodeon proposed was deemed too small, prompting the crew to kindly decline the offer. Number 92. Gur Shorts? Apparently Ricky Simon Simmons was asked if he would like to do some little skits with Gurr back in 2011, but it never went anywhere. He's open to returning to his role of Gurr, but the chips never seem to fall that way. Number 93. Vasquez's favorite character is Dib. He loves his hair, his trench coat, and most importantly, his frustration with the world. It reminds him of a kid's affectation where they think something looks cool on them, but just makes them look a bit silly. Number 94. Vasquez jokes that his favorite episode of Invader Zim was actually a parody made by YouTube animator Hot Diggity Demon Dog. It was called 
called Zim Zam the Spaceman and Robot Rudy. While he says this as a joke, he does believe that it was really well done. Number 95. Okay, but in all seriousness, Vasquez's personal favorite episode from the series is Backseat Drivers from Beyond the Stars because he believes the episode has the best humor while also maintaining a solid plot that wasn't lost in all of the craziness. To him, it's just a perfect episode. It's Ricky Simons' favorite episode too. Number 96. The show's fan base is so massive that an entire convention was created in celebration of the series called InvaderCon. It was held three times in 2011, 2012, and 2014 in the cities of Atlanta, Georgia, Austin, Texas, and LA, California. The initial event was created to celebrate the 10-year anniversary of Invader Zim, and an encore presentation of the convention, InvaderCon 2, DoomCon, took place in 2012. Even people involved in the show's production attended and hosted panels, including Richard Horvitz, Annie Bertman, Melissa Fawn, Ricky Simons, Roger Bumpus, and Jonan Vasquez himself. InvaderCon was in no way paid for or endorsed by Nickelodeon. Everything that went into it came out of the pockets of Zim's legion of devoted love pigs. Number 97. At InvaderCon 2, the original cast got together to do a live reading of an Invader Zim script that never made it into production called The Trial. The Trial would have focused on an Urken event known as an Existence Evaluation, a trial in which the Urken's control brains review an Urken's past in order to determine whether or not they are worthy of being remembered in Urken history or deemed defective, in which case they are deactivated and erased from Urken history. The tallest bump Zim's existence evaluation up by a few decades in an unsuccessful attempt to rid the Urken Empire of his antics forever. Number 98. The trial would have also shed more light on not only Zim's past, but of pasts of the current almighty tallest, red and purple. According to the events of the trial, Zim was responsible for the death of two previous almighty tallest, whose names were Miyuki and Spork. Both of these tallest were consumed by an infinite energy absorbing blob created by none other than Zim. Purple and red were actually the same age as Zim and were in the same training program as well. Number 99. After much talk, Oni Press announced that they were partnering with Nickelodeon and Jonan Vasquez to continue the Invader Zim series. But instead of an animated series, this continuation was in the form of a comic book series. Number 100. Several crew members from the original animated run returned to help with the comic series. This includes Jonan Vasquez himself, Eric Trueheart, Aaron Alexovic, and Ricky Simons. Like Jonan, Ricky had also worked on comics as a colorist and writer. He wrote for Robotech clone in the 90s with his illustrator wife, Tavisha, as well as his own series, Rankle Chick and His Three-Legged Cat. Number 101. In issue 0 of the Invader Zim comic, Truth Shrieker, it was implied, though never confirmed, that Dib is a clone of his father, Professor Membrane, and not his real son. Ooh, tough break, kid. Number 102. Dib and Gaz didn't have an official last name until issue 5 of the comic series, and it was only assumed that their last name was Membrane. However, this was confirmed to be true, and their last name is in Indeed, membrane. I mean, what else would it be, am I right? Number 103. While Vasquez felt like Gaz was a bit simple in the animated series, he definitely likes Gaz better in the comic series. He feels as though she's more fleshed out and more fun in general. Number 104. Issue number one, the first official issue of the series, graced us in its presence on July 8, 2015. Zim fans, you know what to do. Buy it. Number 105. Out of all the characters Vasquez was excited to get back to, he was probably most excited about Gaz. He was quoted saying, I think she got the least love in the series. She just kind of had a role to play. There really wasn't much room for her to be more of a person. Number 106. Vasquez looks back on the Zim project fondly, but looking through his old jokes, he thinks to himself and says, I don't think I would have let that through now. While he has grown to do new things, he understands that Zim has a lot of random humor that made it charming. According to him, quote, for me, it's never been, hey, let's throw that in there because it's so random. That's why it's funny. Especially in terms of Gur. Gur does what he does, and there's no explanation for what Gur does than the fact that he's made out of garbage. Number Number 107. Jonan Vasquez brought the craziness of Invader Zim to Cartoon Hangover. He's responsible for writing the Bravest Warriors episode, The Puppetyville Horror, which you should totally go watch after this. And those are 107 facts you should know about Invader Zim. Hit that subscribe button for more 107 facts, and if you want us to do 107 on your favorite show, let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and remember, Frederator loves you.